The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, A Sure Inheritance. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for overflowing grace that has come to us in spite of our sinfulness, and only because thou art the God of all grace. We worship thee and glory in the fact that thou art the God of love and mercy and compassion toward those who come to the cross of Jesus Christ. Speak to each listening heart in this hour to bring salvation and growth. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We now study Romans 8, verse 17, the phrase, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, man's laws do not always conform to God's laws. Man may be actuated by pride, selfishness, or any one of a hundred other carnal reasons. But God always moves according to his holiness and his righteousness. If we have become his children, we are then his heirs. There is no possible chance of a child of God being disinherited. Any thought of such a thing will be dissipated when we come to the study of the inner meaning of the last half of this verse with its restriction. There is no possible grounds upon which a child of God can be disinherited by the Father. The whole doctrine of justification has been presented in earlier chapters of this epistle, and to introduce the idea of disinheritance at this point would be to nullify everything that has gone before and make the interpretation of the Word of God a patchwork thing, dictated by human logic instead of by the teaching of the Holy Spirit. You may be sure that if you ever find a contradiction in the Word of God, you have a false interpretation. And one of the primary laws of biblical interpretation is that you must never use a single, obscure passage to contradict a great line of doctrine that is substantiated by long and solid paragraphs of definite teaching. The reasoning that is set forth here is purely divine. If children, then heirs. Now there are two parts of the phrase, two nouns, children and heirs. There is an if associated with the first of these words, but there is no if attached to the second word. He must set forth the doubt in connection with sonship because there are some of his creatures, as we have seen, who are not his children. But if once a child of Adam has been joined to Jesus Christ, he has been born of the Spirit into the family of God, he has received the spirit of adoption by which he cries, Abba, Father. Rainsford has written a beautiful paragraph on this relationship. See the title, certainty, character, inalienable nature, as well as the evidence and condition of our divine sonship and inheritance, as set before us in this beautiful passage. If children. The beloved disciple divides the children into babes, young men, and fathers. But they are all equally dear children. Whatever be their spiritual age, or the amount of their growth and development attained to in the Christian life, whether they be babes or young men or fathers. They are equally the dear children of God. Their title is Christ's own title. Their inheritance is Christ's own inheritance. Their security is Christ's own security. They have their title, inheritance, and security, not only in him, but with him forever. Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Our childhood has its birth and being in receiving Christ by faith, believing on Christ, trusting in Christ. Our privilege and high calling is to abide in Christ. He never ceases to be the shelter for his children. Our strength and fullness is in union with him, our glorious prerogative to be inhabited by his spirit and our blessing to be led by that Spirit, and be taught of God, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If children, none are children by nature, it is all by grace. 
None are children by deserving it, and none are children by the will of the flesh. We are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If we trace this divine relationship to its source, we shall find it to be the fruit of God's electing love. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. It is the fruit of his predestinating grace. So we read, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And all the glory that follows flows from that divine, everlasting, and most gracious planning. If then we are children, it is by divine adoption, and glory be to God, we inherit not only the privilege of the adopted child, but the nature of the adopting father. For it is written, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation, made partakers of the divine nature as well as adopted into the divine family, united to the firstborn, received into communion by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. We are to be for an habitation for God through the Spirit. One of the hardest lessons for man to learn is that everything that God does for us is by grace. Man is so eager to have some credit for his blessings that it is difficult to take the place of utter bankruptcy that is necessary in our attitude toward God. This is all the more true because of the teaching of some who make salvation conditional on something that man does, even if it is nothing more than uh, accepting. If you will search your own heart, most of you will find a trace of that legalistic spirit. Man cannot understand that God, in his sovereign love, stoops over a lost race, dead in trespasses and sins, totally responsible, yet totally incapable of doing anything about it, and that he decides to quicken some of his creatures and make them sons. If it be asked why he does not quicken all, we reply that the Bible does not give any answer to this question, and that we are left to trust him who does all things well and who never makes any mistakes. The facts are there. Men fight these facts, but they cannot change them. There is nothing good in any of us that could recommend us to God. Well, then, if he makes a division in the human race, he must do it on some principle that is to be found in himself. It surely is not whim, even though it may appear thus to unholy minds, incapable of receiving spiritual things. I've had many people say to me, but it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to as many as believed on his name. And to this I inevitably reply, that while they have quoted John 1.12, the next verse, John 1.13, distinctly denies the implications they are attempting to draw from this text. Why should one verse be made to contradict the next one, simply to satisfy the desire of the human heart, to enter in on some of the credit for our salvation? We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The first act of our being born of God is that we turn back toward him with the new uh, receiver that has just been planted in us supernaturally and with that divinely given ability that we did not before possess, we receive him. It is then that he gives us the authority to become his sons or to change the figure and the verse. He plants within us a new willer and we immediately become one of the whosoever wills. I have known people who fight this truth with vehemence, but that does not change the scores of verses which teach this truth. Contrary teaching has been ingrained into them so deeply that they find it hard to credit the sovereign grace to needy sinners, which God has shown in doing everything in behalf of his own. Their predicament is something like that of small children who have been wrongly taught about their own origin and who are suddenly faced with biological truth, which is so alien to all of the dream world which they have imagined. 
I read some time ago in the Reader's Digest the story of a little girl who asked her mother where she had come from. The mother replied that the stork had brought her. And where did you come from, mother? The child continued. Oh, said the mother, I was found in a cabbage patch. And grandmother, the girl asked, questioning further. Oh, grandmother was found in a rose bush. The next day, it is said, the little girl wrote a composition on her class paper, which said, There has not been a normal birth in our family for three generations. Now the precocious child had common sense that was based on truth that she had gained some place or other. We know that there are others who have believed the old wives' tales which they have heard, and sometimes their own marital lives have been greatly disturbed by the shock that has come from growing up and learning reality. And there are some who pass out of the stork school of human generation into a half world of truth and error that is also very confusing. In the course of my ministry, I ran across the case of a girl who had been oversheltered by well-meaning parents and who was ignorant of the facts of life, even after she knew that the human body had something to do with the bringing forth of the life of the next generation, she seriously thought, as late as her 18th year, that boys came from the right breast of the mother and girls from the left. She was not more to be pitied than I was in the days when I followed what I call the stork school of theology. To think that salvation is a gift in exchange for something which God finds in a child of fallen Adam is as foolish as to think that babies are to be found in rose bushes. And to think that the will of a member of the human race is sufficiently intact to make a choice of Christ on its own initiative makes one a member of the Stork School of Theology. And that's where I was in the early days of my ministry before I began to know the Word of God. I think that most Christians pass through this in the course of their spiritual growth. Now, if you admit the truth, namely that God reaches down and quickens the will of a lost soul, you have sold out your whole position, even though you seek to hold to some of the flutes, some of the wreckage. That God did it all is the Christian doctrine of grace. Nothing else is grace. And once you have understood that you have become a child of God through grace, you can understand our text, if children, then heirs. Just as salvation is by grace, so is the inheritance by grace. During the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus, a certain lawyer attempted to put the Savior to a test, asking the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It should be noted that the emphasis is on the word do. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus understood the implications of the question and asked the man concerning the requirements of the law. The man answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Now this is one of the most condemning verses in the Bible. Do not imagine that you can get to heaven by thinking that it says that you can be saved by aiming to do these things or by trying to do them or by partially doing them. If you are to get to heaven by doing, then these are the things you must do. Let me give you an analogy. Suppose that an airplane in an Antarctic condition comes down in the middle of the ocean. Now, they cannot be saved by their own efforts. One man swims around in his pride and he says, what must I do to reach land? Well, if you're going to get to land by your own efforts, you must swim. You have a thousand miles to go. Thou shalt swim with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. It doesn't do you any good to have an example of a better swimmer. You do not need to know how to swim. You need a savior. You need to be rescued. Now, on the other hand, if you will only admit that you are a total bankrupt at that moment and that you're in a position where you can do just exactly nothing for yourself, then I will be able to lay hold upon you and lift you into the boat. And when you are back on an ocean liner sometime, you can get to the land just as quickly by sitting in a deck chair and resting as by walking the deck or carrying cargo around the hold. The inheritance is by grace. It comes with the divine sonship. From now on, its scope will be defined and its blessings seen. The remainder of this eighth chapter of Romans will speak of the gifts that are ours in Christ, the power that is available for us, 
the purpose that God had in saving us, the aim which he has for our growth and conformity to Christ, and the security that is ours while we wait for the consummation of his plans. We are heirs, and the inheritance is ours because our Lord died. In the epistle to the Hebrews, we read of this method whereby the inheritance was secured for us. The Lord came as the great high priest, since he has opened the one true way to God which can never be closed. Christ is the one mediator between the soul and God. In the Old Testament, the way to God was kept open by a priesthood which killed sacrificial animals, shedding their blood as a picture of the death of the Lord Jesus. How much more, we read in Hebrews 9, how much more than these animal sacrifices shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, Jesus Christ is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. In passing, it should be noted that the inheritance is called the eternal inheritance. If it could be lost or alienated in any way, it would have had to be described in other terms, just as eternal life could not be lost after ten years, else it would have had to be called ten-year life. So the eternal inheritance is ours by the same title that we have become sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The next verse then continues, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. We know that this is true in our ordinary dealing with estates. I almost got an inheritance once. Early in my ministry, I went to a certain part of our country to preach for some special meetings. I was entertained in the home of a friend of long standing. He took me out on a drive into the mountains to show me the autumn coloring. We parked on a river overlooking the valleys aflame with color. While there, he began to tell me how he had been blessed financially. Everything he had touched had turned to gold. It should be realized that this was in 1929, about a month before financial crash that brought on the Great Depression. My friend concluded, Donald, I have recently made my will. I've decided to leave you a legacy of $10,000. I thought my heart would stop beating for a moment. And then he went on, I've been very successful while you have gone into the ministry. I can foresee that I will have a large fortune while you will never become rich. So I decided to put this in my will for you and to stipulate that it's not for radio work or any other part of your work, but that you can do what you please with it and spend it as you wish. Well, during the next week or two, I spent that $10,000 in a dozen ways, bringing up fancies that could be realized with such a sum. It's just as well that I did that dreaming, for I, I never came into that inheritance. My friend isn't dead yet. I'm very glad that he is still alive, but the thought of the legacy has grown dim with the years and comes to me now only as a sermon illustration. For about a month after the conversation, the bottom dropped out of the Wall Street market, the bank holiday came upon America, and the Great Depression arrived. I know that my friend moved from a large house to a small one, and that he gave up his large car for a second-hand model in the low-price field, and I'm quite sure he has changed his will. Now, nothing is truer than the Bible verse which says that a will is worth nothing until the person who made the will has died. This is exactly how our inheritance has come to us. The Lord Jesus Christ loved us because his very being is love. In order that we might have all things in him, he died that our inheritance might be made sure unto us. And then, thank God, in order that there might be no question about our inheritance, he arose from the dead in order that he might become the executor of his own estate. It's very necessary that an estate have a good executor. Many an inheritance has been dissipated because it was not properly managed. I remember one story of a man who died leaving his partner as executor, but the partner had difficulties in his own financial life. Again, it was at the time of the Great Depression, and succumbing to temptation, the partner pledged the securities of his dead friend and lost them all. Only when the last asset was gone did he come to the end of himself and face the prison term that lay before him. 
the widow, of course, had lost all through his malversation. But thank God, with the risen Lord Jesus Christ managing the gifts which he secured for us at the price of his blood, he will be able to say forever, as he has said to his father the night before he was crucified, these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. I pray for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. What a position! What an inheritance! How God has bound us up with his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has begotten us from the dead translated us from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of the Son of his love, adopted us into the high portion that goes with our sonship, and has given us an eternal inheritance. How often we are forced to stand speechless after we have said, What more can he say than to you he hath said? How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word, what more can he say than to you he hath said? If children, then heirs. And our God and Father, we thank thee for our inheritance. And we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall take it to our hearts this day, and that we may begin to live in the high privilege that is ours through Christ. May thy grace, thy mercy, thy peace abide, and a new sense of all the great glory that thou hast given us in Christ. And unto thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all the glory and the majesty, the dominion and the power, now, till our Lord come again and forever. Amen.